Welcome to Three Thoughts On. Today we continue the series on communications. If you are a listener of this podcast, you know that I believe we need to do better in how we communicate with ourselves and with each other. I believe that being able to elegantly, effectively, and responsibly craft, convey, and consume information is essential for our communities to thrive. Today my guest, Rebecca Roberts, shares with us her insights on how storytelling is a type of communication that goes far beyond traditional entertainment. Rebecca is a communications coach and storytelling consultant. For the past 10 years, she specialized in working with the inner narratives that shape our behavior, well-being, and capacity to influence and connect in the professional domain. She is the founder of Inner Architecture and works with teams and individuals to master sense-making through storytelling. Her background as an interior architect and workplace culture strategist also gives a unique perspective into the critical role that communication plays in the world of personal and professional transformation. The ultimate focus of this work is to increase confidence and mental ease and create a more meaningful impact for both ourselves and the world around us. Rebecca and I connected on social media through common acquaintances and her content resonated with me greatly. I hope you enjoy this conversation. And now, Rebecca Roberts. Welcome to Three Thoughts On. Today, we have Rebecca Roberts. Rebecca, how are you today? I'm very good. How are you? I am doing well, having a great day so far. I am very excited about this this conversation because it's a bit different than all the other ones I've had already. Um, and uh, I'm really eager to see where this is going to take us and, and, and what kind of new things I'm going to learn on this. So can you take a minute and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how did you arrive at, at this, doing this that you love so much? Sure. So what this is, is the topic of storytelling. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times we all have different ideas when we hear certain words and storytelling is one that conjures up different things for different people. And the way that I look at it is storytelling is this aspect of how we communicate through our personal experiences to build bridges of communication. And how I got into all of this is a bit roundabout, but it's a, it's a lovely story of my background is in um, interior architecture and design. And I was always working with workplaces and I just, I could always find it so interesting doing interviews with, with different clients and, and seeing how differently people experience their lives and their workplaces. And so that was one of the first things that always came up um, as far as how it could be that somebody has the same boss and the same work um, environment and the same job title as someone else, but their experiences and outlook on life are totally different. And through time, I did a lot of exploration on mindset work, so cognitive behavioral therapy and coaching explorations and these different aspects. And I started realizing that actually, while mindset is one of my favorite things to play with, um, I realized that storytelling was a bit of the shortcut to exploring our mindsets because Really, when we look at our identities, when we look at the mindsets and the beliefs that we have, it is all a compilation of our stories and the stories that we tell ourselves about our own lives, about our experiences, and the stories that we tell about the world around us. And so this is how I've kind of come to this place where I love communication and I love building bridges But I've been able to now, with my work, marry this together with people understanding their own stories better. So these two aspects coming together of storytelling and how we communicate out into the world to build bridges of communication. But then story weaving, which is the, the experience of recognizing that the stories that we're telling inside of our minds before we ever open our mouths are actually what shapes our experience of life. 
That's beautiful. I, you know, there is a school of thought that, and of course, it, it's it's debatable uh, where this uh, argument or debate will end up. But there are some evolutionary archaeologists and evolutionary biologists that talk about, you know, why why did we develop language uh, the way we did versus the rest of uh, creation, if you will. And there are some that believe that we created language or we evolved into creating a language specifically to, to tell stories, Mm -hmm. to, to to tell stories about each other. Right. So it's more like, you know, gossiping, (laughs) if you will, (laughs) but it is really embedded in the core of who we are to be able to talk uh, and to tell a story, it, it, regardless of what the story is, you know, the, the, whether you, you do it you know, verbally, whether yes. you do it through music, whether you do it through some other means, it is embedded in our core to be able to communicate. And one of the re- one of the things that I'm very passionate about is the fact that I feel that as a society we really don't communicate as we should. And that's why I invited you. I'm so thankful that you accepted to be in my podcast because I started listening to some of your content. It's like, wow, this is right in the middle of of, of where I want of my message to be uh, to people that listen to this podcast is, is we can do better. Uh, we can do better uh, talking with each other, talking to ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves to ourselves uh, and, and how we communicate with others. So, when you say you mentioned something interesting there, you, you said you, you you know CBT, you know cognitive behavior therapy and mindset and stuff. <laughs> Can you expand a little bit more on the relationship between that and the the art, if you will, of telling a story? Yeah. So, actually, this is this is one of these things that I our mindset when we when we can start to recognize and just begin to grasp the tip of the iceberg of how powerful our minds are in controlling and contributing to our life experience. That is where we start to recognize that, you know, there are a lot of cliche sayings out there and they're cliche for a reason. There's definitely a lot of truth behind it, but you hear a lot of this fake it till you make it. And you hear like mindset is everything and have a positive outlook. But what's behind all of that is actually that our thoughts are shaping our experience of life. And if I walk around with a belief system that I need to fight for everything, right, that that life is a battle, then I'm going to walk around with that shade of, of glasses and everything will go through that filter, Now, life is so much more dynamic and complex than any one person can actually take in. But the recognition that the lens through which we view everything, which is actually our mindset, is shaping how we are interacting with the world. You know, if somebody comes up to me and is like, hey, punk, what's up? And I've got the idea that I want to fight, my my fists will automatically raise up. If I've got the idea that life is playful, I'd be like, I don't know, what's up with you? You know, and I can, I can start playing back. And it's, I, I find it one of these things that it's instantly recognizable because you can play with this in real time, right? If I'm sitting there and I'm recognizing that I'm feeling super down and I think that life is not supporting me and, and I can ask myself, okay, so what is one thing right now? If I if I change that thought and I thought, you know, life is 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 here to support me. Life is is supporting life, and I am part of life. And so, okay. And instantly, I look around and I start to see all of the ways that life is supporting itself with the growth of you know the sunlight, with the growth of the plants, with all of these different things and they're very simple things, but so are the simple things that we're struggling with. Um, like, you know, I got into a fight with my partner or I'm struggling with my boss, all of these different things. When we start to bring it back to our own personal choices, um, that's where mindset becomes synonymous with 
like personal responsibility, meaning, and I love this definition of responsibility, the ability to respond and just recognizing that that can change everything. So our mindset is shaping our identities, which are so much more malleable than we give ourselves credit for. Um, and, and it's shaping how I view the world and little tweaks in those stories can have massive impacts on how we're approaching the people and the places and the things around us. No, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's that old saying of the world is not the way it is, is the way you see it. Mm. And I tend to, to modify that a little bit. I, uh, we can get into the, the eternal debate of free will, but it, the world is the way I choose to see it. Right. And uh, what lens, like you said, you know, what lens I choose to see the world or what set of lenses. I, I find myself having multiple lenses through which I see the world, depending on the situation. Um, yes. And each lens comes with a different model and a different mindset. And that allows me to then have yes. narratives that are constructive for me in order to be able to carry on and not reacting to the world every time I walk out. Instead, being able to observe, yes. assess, be part of, and then carry on, right? And then that will then build a story that I can tell myself later on of, how was your day? Well, with the proper set of lenses, that narrative would sound a very specific way. Whereas with a different set of lenses, that narrative was going to sound completely different. And then that ends oh, yeah. up shaping tomorrow. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so tell me, um, uh, when we were preparing for the, for the podcast, you said that, you know, you have three thoughts, I guess, on storytelling. Yes. Let's, let's start yes. with number one. So number one, we already touched on, and it's to begin to shape our mindsets, to have a storyteller mindset. Um, and what that is, is in this concept of story weaving, right? It's the fact that in each moment, I mean, there are all of these studies that talk about the amount of inputs that come at us in each moment, that there are trillions of bits of information that are coming at our senses. And then our senses have to narrow down and choose just a few things that come in at any moment. Otherwise, we'd be constantly overwhelmed. And what this story weaving implies or, or touches on is that when we begin to take more control by choice, and I love that you added the choose to, right? Because for me, this is, and it goes into another one of the points that I want to talk about, but when we begin to recognize that I, I can shape what I focus my attention on and where, you know, I love all of these different things like our, our energy is, is focused in on that which we give our attention to. So if I want to focus in on how crappy the entire world is and how everything is going to shit, then, you know, I, I'll have those moments where I'm just sitting there going, I can find infinite evidence to prove this. Infinite evidence. And if I view the world as this wondrous place, which is extraordinary, then I can find infinite evidence to prove this. And so this storyteller mindset is the capacity to recognize that the world that I am creating with my words that I'm sharing and bridging out is first shaped inside of my own mind. And if the stories that I want to tell are of, you know, destruction and woe and separation, then I can find every evidence to back that up. And at the same time, if like I do. <laughs> I want to tell stories that are talking about how we can celebrate our differences and how it's actually the diversity that is what makes us so incredible and wonderful as human beings. So trying to, as much as possible, bring this idea of unification, then the lens that I'm looking through the world is looking for examples of this. And there are as many examples of unification as there are of disunification and disruption. And so it's, it's not about being ignorant to the rest of the world, but it's recognizing that we only have a finite amount of focus 
and that we have the choice to direct our minds, you know, and the more we become aware of that, the more we can highlight and, and grow bigger, zoom into those beautiful aspects of life that live around us. That's very interesting. So let me throw something at you and see if it resonates with you. Um, I happen to be of the belief that that words matter. Uh, And depending on who you talk to, we are language because how do you, how do you convey something that doesn't have a word, right? It's very difficult. Like, you know, define the color blue. I read somewhere at one point that it, it took the Greeks quite a while before they actually had the word blue. Um, so if you, if you read, for example, the Iliad, you know, or the Odyssey that mm. you pay attention how, how uh, he was describing the sky, he never actually used the word blue because apparently they did not have a word blue. Right. So, and you think about that it's something so simple. It's like, well, tell me what is blue? Mm. How do you do that mm. without the word blue? We've agreed mm. what blue is because we, we see it and we point to it, right? But mm. it matters that we have words. So it matters the language and the quality of the language and the diversity of words. And I happen to, I mean, English is my second language, and I, I, I try really, really hard to enrich that language as much as possible so that I can have a rich vocabulary because a rich vocabulary not only uh, challenges this, uh, challenges my brain cognitively, but yeah. it also allows me to express myself in a way that is richer, right? Yes. And in my mind, that then leads to a better quality of communication. And in this case, a better quality of stories is you, mm. you, you agree, disagree. You want to add anything to that? So there's one part that I totally agree with. And another part that I'm still exploring for myself, um, because I think words are incredible, right? I, I think language is one of these aspects to life that, it's so complex. It's so dynamic. It has the chance to be like, like insanely diverse. And at the same time, that moment that a parent first hears like the uttering of their child saying their name, right? Sometimes the simplicity of it is also exquisite. Um, and in today's world, one of the things that I see is a whole lot of people with beautiful language skills and their words don't mean much. And so I think that also there's some aspect to it is that there's um, a certain amount of integrity that goes behind it, but that is paired with intention, right? What is the action or the meaning behind why I'm choosing to speak in the first place? Um, and that is that is a place where the words are still meaningful, but they can tear down or build up in these different ways. Um, But there are also times where people just stop listening. It doesn't matter how powerful the words are. You see that a lot in government, actually, right? Right. There are a lot of times where people are listening to politicians talk, and I'm not just singling out politicians, but it's one place that's very obvious, um, is that a lot of people feel like, well, I, you're using pretty words and congratulations, but I don't see anything coming from it. So it means so little to me. So parts of ourselves, when we don't see actions matching up with the words, part of ourselves shut off and we don't allow for those bridges of connection when the intention is not actually there and clear from the speaker. So it's one of those really interesting things, right? And at the same time, words have the power to destroy. They have the power to rebuild. They have the power to inspire and to make people fall in love and all different things. So I I find language such a beautiful dynamic um, in in these ways for exactly this reason, right? Yeah, no, I I agree. I agree. Intention matters in, Mm. um, in, in what you do matters uh as a result of of acts you know and actions that are coming and going with with the language 
Let me ask you before we get into the second one, or maybe this leads into the second one, but do you separate communication from storytelling? Or in, in your mind, are those two one or the same? <laughs> <laughs> It's a really good question. Um, in I, They feel like they're intertwined. So there are aspects that are specific to storytelling. It's a little bit like the old adage, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not necessarily a square. Um, in that there are aspects to storytelling that are very specific to how we communicate experiences and things. And same with, with communication. There are ways that we express ourselves in different ways. I, I, I haven't found the way yet to, um, to divide them up into two different categories, but when I, I feel like sometimes they fall in different buckets as far as what we're exploring and that it may be easier to explore a topic from the specific standpoint of storytelling or the broader range of general communication, because then that also plays into how do we communicate data and information? How do we teach? How do we do all of these different things for which storytelling is one part of communication? Interesting. Okay. I, I, I can definitely see that. I can see that, that, that interconnectivity and, and also from reading different authors, right? You see, mm. you see at the different types of storytelling, you know, one that goes straight to the point and one that kind of has to talk about the setting and kind of talks about all the background before mm. you get to the point. And I can see different types of people being, uh open to one versus the other right and then how to how to how do we then take that in and bring it into our day-to-day -day lives which is what i'm always interested in it's like how do we learn from this style of communication uh yeah to enhance and enrich our lives and the quality of our conversations which is at the end of the day what we want right amen totally totally <laughs> so what yes. will be the second thought so the second thought plays into this topic of intention. And I love that you also asked the question between communication and storytelling, because this lives in the middle of that. And I love the acronym that comes with this because it just makes me laugh, but it's how to get fat with your audience. <laughs> and that, that FAT stands for how do we pay attention to when we are speaking? What is it that we want our audience to feel in this moment? What is it that we want them to act on in what we're saying? What are the thoughts? What, are, what do we want them to think? And so this feel, act, think aspect, um, it has a way of narrowing down our focus so that, I mean, we've all sat in those meetings, right, where we're sitting there going, this could have been an email. Like this could have been a three-line email. Why are we having an hour-long meeting for this? Or we've had moments where we were, we were hit with so many different emotions in one particular talk or one particular interaction that we're like, I don't, like, I don't know whether they were angry with me. I don't know whether I'm their favorite person. Like, I'm so confused. And so when, before we have any type of communication, I do this a lot with, with clients who, especially who are doing a lot of um, trainings and workshops and things like this, that... When we stand up in front of anyone, be it in a professional setting, which is what I do mostly, but also in front of our partners, in front of our kids, in front of our friends, like when we ask ourselves these things of how would I want my friend to feel when I'm sharing this information, right? It might be that they feel like, oh my gosh, this is scandalous, right? Or you, maybe you're telling a dramatic story or maybe you want them to feel how much you love them. Um, what are the actions that you want your audience to take, right? Is it that there's some kind of thing that they need to do once you finish talking that you want them to take action for in their own lives or together with you? Um, and then what are the things that you want to inspire them to be thinking about, reflecting in their own lives, these different explorations, because it has this way of weeding out a lot of unnecessary information from our stories, 
because stories can become very colorful and very verbose. And sometimes, you know, you're sitting there and you're going, that is amazing. I know exactly what the room looked like and smelled like and everything, but what the hell are you talking about? Right. What's the point? And so exactly. So this is, this really brings it to a very like head, heart, hand kind of, um, focus, What do I want them to be thinking? How do I want them to be feeling? And what actions do I want them to be taking? And from that, naturally, we we start to say, well, okay, if I want them to feel like this, what do I need to do? What do I need to talk about? How do I need to speak? All of these different things um, that, that that then focus actually what we deliver. So it actually gives us a framework. It starts with the high level and then we can, we can dive deeper into, okay, what then does that actually look like in real life when I'm going to stand in front of my partner, my boss, 5,000 people for a talk. So let me, there's a few things there I want to touch on. Uh, yeah. Let me see if I can, if, if I'm, if we're correlating here. So, so you, you, that proverbial example of this could have been an email, <clears throat> Um, that, uh, yes. Yeah. Every day, you know, you see that in corporate America or corporate, wherever you see that, well, why are we having this call? Why are we having this meeting when this could have been an email? Yeah. It seems to me that that's very easy to, it's very easy to arrive to that conclusion, but the opposite is not so obvious. Like when there is an email that should have been a meeting that <laughs> should have been a conversation. And yes. as a result of that, it's not just one email, but now it's 15. It's now a trail, right, yes. of emails. And, yes. and and that should have been handled on a call or on a conference call or on a conversation or a meeting. Yes. Have you found ways to, in advance, discern mm. when we should have that meeting versus when should it be an email? Mm. <laughs> so part of this comes down to emotional intelligence, right? Being able to put ourselves in the shoes of if I'm about to send out an email that says like, Hey guys, we're going to do like a 15% um, pay cut across the board. Hope you're having a great Thursday, right? Like <laughs> I can't, I, I can't tell too much to somebody who would think that that's a great idea to do in an email. Um, Other than, hey, maybe some self-awareness practices and some mindfulness work might be supportive. Uh, But there's this element to that same feel, think, and act um, can apply to any type of communication, written, verbal, whatever it might be. And if I'm recognizing that one of the things that I want people to feel is safe, right? That should be my number one clue. If I can imagine that whatever I'm going to convey could make people feel really uncomfortable and really uncertain, then there's a good chance that I should be doing this in person or some kind of a personalized format and not just a text or a written format. I love that. I love that. I, I, that sounds, yeah. So let me, let me throw something else at you. Um, with this feel act and Thoughts. It, uh-huh. As you were talking, it, it reminded me of an interview I saw. Uh, I saw a, a Sting give an interview. I'm a, I'm a I would say, a, a amateur musician. I play the guitar and I sing. <laughs> so I love, I love to listen to, to to true musicians talk about, you know, their experience. And he said something once that just it stayed with me, and I think it relates to this. And I'll let you tell me if it does or it doesn't, but. He says that as he's performing, he likes to listen to the listening. Mm. That there is a feeling, right? There is a feeling. And I find myself this like tomorrow I have a performance. So I, you know, I always prepare myself and I then try to get, you know, I'm doing my thing. I'm doing my thing. I'm singing, I'm playing the guitar, I'm doing my thing, but I'm also paying attention to the listening because there's a feeling that comes back when you're in a room. Right, and you're trying to convey a message. In my, in my case, if I'm, you know, if I'm, you know, do, I do a fair amount of public speaking too, or whether I'm performing, I'm looking for that feedback that is nonverbal, 
yes. as a response to the verbal, in, what I'm conveying verbally, if you will. Yes. So I'm listening to the listening. And that listening, it has a sound and it has a feel. Um, mm. it, is it one of the goals of adequate storytelling to also be listening to that listening? Absolutely. I mean, look, a storyteller is nothing without their audience. If you are just talking at people with no concept of how that is landing and no sensitivity to what the intention is, and that sometimes even with the best intentions of considering how you wanted something to land, that we can't and we shouldn't and we aren't inside of other people's heads. There are times when we may say something and it lands totally opposite of what we imagined. If I just keep talking and I don't give a crap about what it is that you're experiencing, like I'm not serving myself or you. And so this is one of the other huge aspects. It's not the third one that I had, but it's massive is that we are nothing without the, the bridge coming back from our audience. And so that listening to the listening, I, I just posted out a video in, was it today, maybe, that was talking about one of these really cool side effects of becoming a storyteller and stepping more into that role, is that we, we become more present with the moment because as we learn like how important it is to be aware of our situations, like to build that mindfulness of taking in the details so that we can share those stories again, in that moment, we begin to have this I don't know how to say it other than this capacity for a little bit of a split mind. One part of us is fully present, immersed in the moment. And then our minds are beautifully complex enough for part of us to be able to zoom out and be like, what, what's happening right here, right? We have the capacity to see what's going on with other people's faces and to read body language. A lot of times things that we don't even know we understand, right? We're picking up on micro expressions and things like this, but we can feel it. If I'm sitting there and I'm having a conversation with someone and they've leaned back and their arms are crossed, right? Something in me knows that my audience is not fully on the same page as me. And so it's in those moments to have enough courage to say like, okay, <laughs> pause, how, what do I need to do to re-engage my audience? Is there something that I can do? And it depends on the setting, right? If you're up on stage, maybe it's to be a little bit more interactive with your audience. If I'm in a workshop, I mean, that it takes a little bit of bravery at times, but I can say, hey guys, how's everybody doing right now, right? Like, are we all on the same page? Anybody have any questions, concerns, comments, criticisms? And I can open the door for communication to happen in two ways in those cases. If I'm giving a talk, I can also play a little bit with the audience. Maybe I've lost their attention. Maybe they're exhausted. Maybe they didn't want to be there. Maybe they're not a captive audience, <laughs> right? Their boss has made them come or whatever it might be. And so that capacity to listen is I mean, I would say it is equally as important as the capacity to be able to speak to convey that information because we are nothing without our audience. So let me let me ask you a question. So is it safe to assume that because I, this I, I can I can relate to this, you know, and, mm. and I, I I tend to be uh, a fair amount of my time surrounded by people, so there, there's it, it's easy to be reading the room and and reading or or if it's one on one conversations to. Uh, to read the other person. But if I'm yeah. trying to convey a story or a message or communicate something in written form, then is it safe mm. to assume that then I have to become my audience uh, as I'm writing to make sure that, and then I have to make sure that I'm responsible enough to not be biased. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is also just the aspect of, of what it means to be empathetic, Right. Like, uh, let's go back to that topic of the 15% pay cut, right? <laughs> I, again, not a good idea to put this in writing, but let's just, for the example's sake, say I did. 
empathy is not that I know exactly how you felt or that you would feel. Empathy is that I can put myself in the emotional experience of what I think you might feel (laughs) and then put myself back in and say, when have I felt unsafe? When have I felt uncertain? And what would have been supportive to me in those moments? Because sympathy is like, oh my God, I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't. You like, even if it's exactly the same situation that you've been in, you have no idea how that person's experience is. So it may be understandable, but you don't understand how they're feeling. And so that's why I love this definition of empathy. I think it comes from Brene Brown and all of that research because she says, you know, it's, it's to be able to say, Hey man, I felt really sad and and lonely as well before I, I can feel with you. There's a German word, mitgefühl, like I feel with you. Um, and that's what I would say when you're writing something, right? We all have our limitations and there will be times where we fall flat on our faces with communication, where it doesn't land the right way, where we're like, damn, I didn't think about that. Um, but in those cases where we do know that it's going to be a sensitive topic, especially how we want people to feel, then we have the chance to kind of explore, okay, what can I, what can I do with this? How might I be able to mitigate some of those fears, uncertainties, whatever it might be through my written word, through being a little bit more empathetic of what my audience might be feeling. You know, I'm going to go somewhere um, based on something you said, and and I know I may lose some of the audience, but I'm going to make a a portion of the audience uh, a little bit more interested. So you speak German. Yeah. Is that your first language? No, English is my first language. German okay. is my second and it's not uh, perfect, but okay. <laughs> it's okay. coming. Because, you know, so I, I, I'm first language is Spanish, you know, and then English and I speak Portuguese as well. And, um, I find myself at times vacillating with trying to say something in English, but I don't have a word, but I know there's a word in Spanish for yes. it, right? Yes. And I said, well, in Spanish, we have this word, you know, and it means blah, 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 blah. And, and there are times where there is actually an English word. I just didn't know it, right? Sure. Or, or, or it was a word that I knew, but I didn't know, I didn't know it could be used within that context. Yes. And th- this is where, again, you know, the, 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 the comment about the vocabulary comes into play, that I, I find myself trying to learn new words because as I learn the language more, I feel like I could communicate better, but I feel like there's an unwanted side effect to that, which is as I'm searching for more words to enrich my language, I then end up using words that Mm. the average person doesn't use. So then I end up losing the audience in an unbeknownst to me. And Mm. and at times it it may sound like I'm being snobbish he's like well what is that word where did you get that word it's like well it's in the dictionary you know and, and, and I, <laughs> it exists mm. you know yeah so it, it it's um <laughs> it's obviously not the intent I've, I love i'm up. looking for words because <laughs> i want to be able to communicate as i'm writing some of these episodes you know that the episodes of the podcast that is just me conveying a, a message yes. I, I want to be able to connect with the people who are listening to me but I also don't want to come across like I'm using words that are not part of the, the average colloquialism sort of a particular, you know, group of people. Right. So where, where, where is, where, where have you, first of all, question number one, have, have you encounter this in, and if yes, how do you manage that? Mm. Oh, it's such an interesting thing, right? Because as well, I, There are certain differences, of course, between every different language. Some are much more emotional. Like, for example, if you look at the same textbook that is written in English and then translated into German or vice versa, the German book will almost always be thicker because the the language is more precise than English is. It's also one of the reasons why English is beautiful as an easier language to learn than many because you don't have masculine, feminine, and neutral articles. You don't have all of these different things. The language has its benefits in its simplicity, 
But at the same time, what it trades off for is lack of precision. Um, and, and then same thing, right. With all the Latin based languages, you've got a lot more emotion. I mean, in Greek, I think they have what, how, how many words for the word love, different types of love, familial love, romantic love, erotic love, all of these different things, right. Whereas in English, we're like, I love my hamburger and I love you. Right. It's like, clearly it's not the same, but it's one of the limitations of the language. Um, so with that, I have two different thoughts. Um, one is that there are times when if I'm speaking to um, like somebody from where I grew up in Louisiana, um, then I may have the capacity to speak in a lot of different um a lot of different colloquialisms, a lot of different ways that I can use different vocabulary. Whereas if I'm here and I use all those same things, I will leave people who are non-native English speakers sitting there going like, what the hell is she talking about? Like I, I knew 80% of the words and the ones that I didn't were, re- were really important to understand. Um, so with that, what I would say, it actually, it comes from a TED talk that I think I heard way back and it was listening to an actual astrophysicist speaking about how he explains his work. And he said, you know, there are different levels of how I explain my work. And with storytelling, the analogy or the metaphor is one of the greatest storytelling tools and frameworks that we have. And inherently, a metaphor and an analogy will always fall short of the perfect description. And in those cases, what I would say is there's times when you may have to use a less significant or less perfect word, but you keep your audience. I would say it's more important to keep the audience than it is to lose them with feeling like they're inadequate, that their language is not enough, whatever it might be. Um, If you're speaking to a purely academic audience, go for it, my gosh. Um, But there are times where it's worth using two or three other words or even saying there's this beautiful word in Spanish, this, you know, and it means loosely translated da, 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 X, Y, Z, right? Because then you get to share something with people or if there's really a perfect word that you can use that's in English, um, you can also say, okay, so I know this is a bit of an obscure word, but I love it because it's so perfect. And you can use that as a teaching moment. There are times when I do that because I find like, oh my gosh, this juicy, delicious word. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I want to use it so bad. But I also get that I didn't know it before 30 minutes ago. So of course, there's going to be a lot of people that don't know this. So I can actually make that part of the, the topic of discussion of saying like, I learned this new word and I want to share it with you. And so these are the ways that we can also play with language. And I think that that's so important to be playful with it. Well, that is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Well, we are out of time. Uh, what would you like to leave the audience with and where can they find your work? What would I like to leave the audience with? I, you know, the thing that I would love to leave people with is that There are times when I think we get a little bit mystified and we think storytelling is this incredibly dynamic, mysterious thing that some people are really good at and others aren't. Um, And I, I just challenge that. There are people that have honed those skills over their lifetimes that were born with great influencers who, like their parents or grandparents, were incredible storytellers and so they had a natural gift. Um, But this skill, this capacity to communicate our ideas and our experiences, I think more and more in the world that we're coming into is absolutely vital to being able to interact because you can have the best ideas, you can have the most beautiful projects. And in today's world, if you cannot captivate an audience, it doesn't matter how incredible that information, that project, that opportunity is, you will be lost in in the crowd. And so just to recognize that it is not this mysterious thing, that there are absolutely ways to build up these skills um, and, and that it can actually not only enhance, but it 
it makes life so much richer and more dynamic with the interactions that then you do end up having both personal and professional. So, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. I, I love how you, how you brought it all together with the professional and the personal because the mm -hmm. audience can be at the workplace or it could be your family, your spouse, your yeah. kids and so forth. So where can people Absolutely. find your work? Are you on social media or you have a web page? I am. I've got a web page that's uh, Rebecca Roberts .com. Um, Another place is YouTube where I love to put out these short videos to inspire and for people to hopefully get a little bit of their curiosity sparked with storytelling and mindset work. So those are probably two of the primary places but yeah there linkedin who knows where, wherever but the the website is probably the easiest because it has links to everything else rebecca this has been a pleasure thank you for accepting to to be my my guest and uh uh have a beautiful day thanks i enjoyed it so much it's super super nice thanks mm -hmm.